Good evening, everyone. I'm Greg Jarrett. Lou Dobbs has the night off. The first trial of the Russia witch hunt wraps up the first week. So far, Mueller's team has tested the court's patience in the Manafort case and focused more on, you know, ostrich jackets and fancy flower beds than any real evidence of collusion. We'll take up the state of the case tonight with Chris Farrell from Judicial Watch and the Washington Examiner's Byron York. Well, the national left wing media caught red handed. Now we're being hindered by the Russian hoax. It's a hoax, okay? So called journalists are caught red handed, lying through their teeth about what the president said in last night's rally. We'll tell you exactly what they're up to just ahead. And an outsider businessman with a conservative message shocks everyone by winning a long shot election. Does that sound familiar? The dean, Ed Rollins, explains how the latest primary results strengthen President Trump's hold on the Republican Party heading into the midterms. We begin with our top story. Another tough day for special counsel Robert Mueller's prosecutors. This is the first week of testimony comes to a close in the trial of Paul Manafort. The prosecution team repeatedly rebuked and scolded by the judge, T.S. Ellis. And today, Judge Ellis reminding Mueller's team of the very high bar for conviction in a criminal case. They have to prove the former Trump campaign chairman knowingly violated tax and bank laws related to his political work overseas. Here's a quote from Ellis, quote, the government has to prove that Manafort knew what the requirement was and that he deliberately violated. On the stand today, an accountant testifying under immunity, admitting she had concerns about Manafort's tax returns, but uh, she filed them anyway. The alleged tax fraud at issue today occurring between 2010 and 2014 before Manafort worked for President Trump and before the 2016 election. And, of course, still no mention of any Russian collusion. In fact, the judge won't even let anyone use it in the courtroom or Donald Trump's name. The prosecution expected to rest its case next week. And a source close to Manafort's team told Fox News the defense has not as yet decided whether Manafort himself, the defendant, will take the witness stand. Joining us now, Chris Farrell, director of investigations and research for Judicial Watch. You know, Chris, so they have to prove intent in a criminal case which is why in most cases when people evade taxes, um, it is a civil penalty. They have to pay a fine, a penalty, interest, back taxes. And normally when they're convicted in a criminal case, you do about a year behind bars. Um, Robert Mueller is asking for 305 years behind bars for Paul Manafort. Is this another example of the malevolence and the abusiveness of Robert Mueller? Pure overkill and pure abusive power. Uh, this is so over the top, so excessive, such a really reckless uh, exercise in order to try to squeeze Manafort into saying anything that they can possibly dream of uh, against President Trump or his close advisors. Uh, you know, this is this is the judicial abuse at the same level as the investigative abuse where they were trying to steer an election. Well, now they're trying to delegitimize and conduct lawfare against a sitting president. It's outrageous. Um, I would underscore the term outrageous. You're absolutely right. Let me go to something else, because you have been able to, through a lawsuit, get your hands on FBI documents they never wanted you to see. Now... <laughs> It's true that they are ridiculously redacted, which is what the FBI does. They routinely hide and conceal evidence and deceive uh, FOIA requests as well as courts. But you found out through these documents that Christopher Steele, the author of the anti-Trump dossier, who was on the payroll, by the way, of Hillary Clinton, he was a confidential source, an undercover agent for the FBI, between January 1st, 2016 and November 1st, 2016, that's seven months before uh, the FBI signed papers formally launching the Trump-Russia case, right? Yeah, you're exactly correct. And the documents we obtained today through a, a FOIA lawsuit in federal court 
uh, detail uh, both a, a period when Steele was admonished by the FBI. He had done something wrong. Probably lied. Lied, or he was being cute, and he was you know, basically being an intelligence peddler. He was selling information from one client and simultaneously providing it to the FBI for an additional fee. That's speculation on my part, but that's also based on my past life experience, dealing with uh, less than scrupulous sources. That's the sort of thing that will get mm -hmm. an admonishment. And then, of course, finally, we've, we see today the termination uh, paper, uh, paperwork, where the FBI uh, cut him loose uh, because he had revealed or exposed his confidential human uh, asset relationship with the FBI. All right, so the FBI and the Department of Justice used this phony fabricated dossier, unverified, right. to gain a wiretap warrant from a FISA court. Um, that was sometime in October, and of course the FBI um, redacted the exact date. But is, does it look to you like based on the sequence of event and these documents you've obtained, that the FBI and the Department of Justice knew that Christopher Steele was a liar uh, before they ever filed their application to spy. Absolutely. I mean, they had sufficient grounds. They already had admonished him for some kind of misconduct. And then they knew the kind of game that he was playing. And, of course, eventually they had to disclose to the court in very soft I would say dishonest terms that they had terminated him uh, because of his unreliability and his falsehoods. Uh, look, they had a lot of guilty knowledge. They were not forthcoming with the court. In my opinion, they perpetrated the fraud upon the court. Right. Uh, those warrants were unlawfully obtained. They did not contain full, complete, accurate information. And you had supervisory special agents and uh, senior Justice Department officials signing off on them. I mean, this is, addition this is compounding perjury as you go along. I wrote a book, The Russia Hoax. It came out about 10 days ago. I have and a I copy. Outlined <laughs> this thank you. I outlined this very argument yep. in the book. And the other thing I point out, I dug through court documents in Great Britain where Christ Christopher Steele admits that his phony dossier is not only questionable in terms of its veracity, but uh, he also says it's unverifiable. In other words, nobody could possibly verify it because it's based on a quadruple hearsay and anonymous sources. It's a work of fiction is what it is. I mean, uh, somebody could draft up a novel or something and submit it to a court. That doesn't mean it's real or it's true or it's accurate. Uh, there's all sorts of, look, it's, it's reckless and it's corrupt as hell. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've read that dossier. Anybody can read it online. You should, because it's guaranteed to get a laugh. I mean, it's utterly ludicrous. I never fail to, uh, to laugh when I read this thing. So the FBI knew it was phony. I mean, you just look at it, and it's preposterous. And I mean, as laughable as it is, the, 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 the tragic part, the outrageous part is it's the predicate. It's the foundation for, you know, a year-long surveillance of somebody who had virtually no connection to the campaign. Right. And it's part of this whole, you know, Russia hysteria, which is a manufactured lie. Is it clear to you, and as I write in the book, it's clear to me, that the Trump-Russia collusion investigation was really triggered by this phony dossier. The initial memo was written June 20th. Uh, and on the very day that Comey is clearing Clinton, the FBI is meeting in a building in London secretly with Christopher Steele, who surely gave them the dossier. And three weeks later, they formally signed the papers to launch the Trump-Russia case. Yeah, there's no coincidences here. I mean, when you look at the timeline, it is incredibly damning. Uh, there's a lot of guilty knowledge. There's a lot of perjury. There's a lot of very deliberate... Uh, there's a sequence of actions that show that this is a, a, a planned out, deliberate, corrupt effort to steer an election. It's that simple. And if you want to read more about it, read The Russia Hoax, the illicit scheme to clear Hillary Clinton and frame Donald Trump. Chris Farrell, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Greg. Some breaking news tonight. A George W. Bush appointed federal judge has ordered the Trump administration to restart the DACA Arrivals Program, the Obama-era pro program, protects illegal immigrants brought to the United States as children from deportation. It is ruling, Judge John Bates says, the court simply holds 
that if DHS wishes to rescind the program or to take any other action for that matter, it must give a rational explanation for its decision. In other words, they only gave stupid reasons for it and not good ones. Um, that's on Secretary Nielsen, by the way, Secretary of Homeland Security. Bates is delaying implementation of his order until August 23rd to give Nielsen the chance to actually do her job correctly. Coming up next, President Trump fighting back against the Mueller witch hunt. Now we're being hindered by the Russian hoax. It's a hoax, okay? I'll tell you what, Russia's very unhappy that Trump won. The national left-wing media twisting those words, and of course they are lying. We'll tell you all about it coming up next. Welcome back. President Trump calling the Mueller witch hunt a hoax last night in Pennsylvania. But this morning, the left wing media intentionally duped its viewers. It was extraordinary that a couple of hours after his entire national security apparatus appeared in the White House briefing room, laying out chapter and verse how Russia continues to interfere in our elections, that the president then went out at that rally and called it a Russian hoax. But the lunacy wasn't just confined to MSNBC. Here's CNN. That a couple of hours after his entire national security apparatus appeared in the White House briefing mm -hmm. room, laying out chapter and verse how Russia continues to interfere in our elections, that the president then went out at that rally and called just it a Russian it. hoax. Well, they ran MSNBC twice in a row. There, CNN did the same. Do you have CNN now? Play CNN. You do not. All right. It was even better on CNN with David Gregory and Allison Camerata. <laughs> Joining me now to talk about it, Byron York, Washington Examiner, Chief Political Correspondent, Fox Business Contributor. Last night when the president said, you know, it's a hoax, he was referring to collusion. He's always referring to collusion. He had just the day before tweeted out, Russia collusion with the Trump campaign, one of the most successful in history, is a total hoax. The intelligence chiefs, Byron, were talking about Russian meddling, not collusion with Trump. So isn't the media really guilty of misrepresenting the truth and conflating two very different things? Well, I think it's, I think it's pretty clear what happened is you're right. The president had his whole team uh, come out in the White House briefing room, and they would not have, not have done it had the president not approved, and talk about what is being done to prevent 2016-style meddling in the 2018 Midterms, And you're absolutely right. When the president talks about collusion, he's talking about the accusation that he or his campaign conspired with the Russians to try to uh, fix the 2016 election. He said that a million times. And when he talks about collusion, that's what he's referring to. And he does believe it's a hoax. It, well, um, it also happens to be the title of a book uh, that's uh, the number one New York Times bestseller. Um, but I, why do they do this? I mean, they, they're deliberate. They know he's referring to collusion. And then they pretend to the viewers he's talking about meddling. And then they try to portray him uh, as either duplicitous or deceptive himself when they're the ones who are what I call in street language lying. Well, uh, there's always been a distinction uh, in or two parts of the Trump Russia investigation. Uh, there is the what Russia did part and then there's the get Trump part. And the what Russia did part is a totally legitimate investigation that uh, were it not for the get Trump element, I think there would have been bipartisan interest in investigating that and coming up with uh, you know, law enforcement and legislative uh, solutions to, to prevent that sort of thing in the future. But there's always been a get Trump element of it, and that's what the president focuses on you know, from before the election and certainly after that moment on uh, January uh, 6th or 7th of 2017 when he's the president-elect and the nation's top intelligence chiefs come into him and talk to him at Trump Tower and James Comey, the FBI head, tells him about this information that he's that the Russians caught him in a sex orgy in Moscow. I mean, ever since then, the president has really talked about this as a hoax. Yeah. 
Byron, you came out with a column that is absolutely excellent, um, and it's entitled 12 Times Christopher Steele Fed Trump-Russia Allegations to the FBI After the Election. After the Election. So in other words, the FBI had fired Christopher Steele for lying, the author of the anti-Trump dos dossier, which they nevertheless used to spy and wiretap. But even after the election, he's still feeding them information about Trump? Yes, this is a very shady arrangement. You're right, they had a deal with Christopher Steele. He was an informant for them. They were going to pay him uh, to keep up his dossier work for the FBI, which is kind of amazing right there. But part of the deal is, if you're a confidential human source for the FBI, you don't go tell everything you know to the press. That's not part of the deal. And of course, Christopher Steele was desperate to get this dossier stuff into the press out in the open in October of 2016. To damage Trump so, because he so was, quote could, unquote, desperate to stop Trump. That's what he told the DOJ. Exactly. So it could affect the election and stop Trump. So the FBI has to cut him off as a source. So you would think that that would be that, but it was not. What happened was they came up with a back channel method of staying in touch with Christopher Steele. The method was Christopher Steele would talk to Bruce Orr, who was the fourth ranking uh, official in the Obama Justice Department, happened to be married to Nellie Orr, a woman who worked for Fusion GPS. Seems like everything's connected here. He would talk to Bruce Orr, and then Bruce Orr would pass on that information to the FBI. So the FBI simply used a cutout to stay in contact with, uh, right. with Christopher Steele. They were Steele. clever and devious about it. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. Did the FBI continue to work with Christopher Steele after the election because, quite simply, they wanted to undo the election results and destroy Trump? Well, if you look at it, there were a dozen meetings between the FBI and Bruce Orr, and the purpose of those meetings was to have Bruce Orr pass on to the FBI what he had been told by Christopher Steele. Starting on November 22nd, a couple of weeks after the election, going all the way to May 2017. And there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the FBI was looking for new information, apparently still uh, trying to pursue this Trump-Russia thing, and two, they were trying to get some sort of confirmation for the dossier allegations that Steele had given them and that they had used in a FISA court to get a warrant uh, against Carter Page. Right. So it's kind of once they were out on the limb, they were trying to find out, gee, is this stuff true? In the FBI regulations, it says you may not use unverified information uh, to gain a warrant in a FISA court. They did it anyway, and so here they are trying to, after the election, yes. after they've used the dossier, they're, they're trying to verify it, knowing full well they ever did, and they totally violated regulations. We'll have to leave it at that, but I recommend to viewers read Byron York's excellent column. It's entitled, 12 Times Christopher Steele Fed Trump-Russia Allegations to FBI After the Election. Great reporting as usual. Thank you, Byron York. Thank you, Greg. New reports tonight that a suspected Russian spy was caught by U.S. authorities after working in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow for more than 10 years. This coming on the heels of a report this week that a mole for the Chinese government infiltrated and worked for California Senator Dianne Feinstein for nearly 20 years. So the Obama spy chiefs were too busy politicking to actually do their jobs and root out a Russian spy. And the Chinese government played Feinstein as she led the Senate Intelligence Committee. Totally played her. Coming up next, President Trump says if you like what his administration is doing, vote Republicans in the midterm elections. We are restoring American strength and we are restoring American pride. But to continue this incredible movement, we must elect more Republicans so we can get the votes that we need to pass these incredible programs. We'll take that up with veteran Republican strategist Ed Rollins. We'll be right back. Welcome back at a strong primary showing last night in Tennessee. Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn won the Republican nomination for Senate to replace the outgoing Bob Corker. In the race for governor, the latest example of the Trump model prevailed. Businessman 
and political outsider Bill Lee won the Republican nomination for governor, despite being greatly outspent by his competitors. Joining me now to talk about it, lead strategist for Great America PAC, former Reagan political director and Fox News political analyst, the dean, Ed Rollins, joins us. Great to see you as always. Well, thank you. Uh, what Dian, do you make of this? Well, it's it's an interesting race. Uh, uh, Diane Black was just chairman of the Budget Committee, was the overwhelming favorite early on. It would be the gubernatorial nominee. I'll spend her opponent. Uh, Bill Lee ran kind of a Trump type campaign. I'm a businessman, a very positive. There were three or four other candidates in the race. Uh, matter of fact, Black came in third place. Uh, uh, on the other side, obviously, uh, uh, Marsha Blackburn won the Senate race easy, which is setting up probably the Senate race across the country with the former governor versus her in a state that traditionally is Republican. What I'm seeing, though, is there's a lot of Republican congressmen, meaning five, six, seven, who have lost in primaries trying to move up. So there's still kind of an anti-Congress sentiment out there, even among Republicans. Uh, and you've got to kind of p position yourself as not part of that, that element there, more, more pro-Trump Trump agenda. Trump uh, holding a lot of rallies uh, these days, very popular, you know, jamming auditoriums and huge arena type facilities. Um, what effect will he have in the midterm elections if, as he says he will, He's going to be out there campaigning, you know, five, six days a week. If he campaigned five, six days a week, he'd be out there more than any, any candidate in my, my history, including Ronald Reagan, who did a lot. Uh, uh, and he and the key thing here is, is, is he going to energize his base, which is very important to do and has to do, because the other side's already energized. And are they going to get re-energized by him coming out and, and doing as he did last night, making attacks on, on the opponent? Uh, I disagree with Bannon's philosophy of making this about impeachment. I make this about the positive things that Trump has done. And if for some reason uh, Democrats lose the win the House, which I don't think they will, or at least if they do, it's very narrow, that it's all about impeachment. It's really all about Trump's accomplishments. And are the Republicans going to go out and argue, as he did very forcefully last night, this is what we've done. This is where the Democratic Party is going. And I think the Democratic Party is really going off a socialist left wing cliff. Speaking of accomplishments, um we got some job numbers out. In July, the U.S. had a record number of people employed and uh, lowered Hispanic unemployment. Uh, I think we have some numbers there we can put up on the screen. There they are. Look at this. Um, so how does that factor into the overall midterm election picture? It factors in, in a very positive way. Uh, uh, Trump is now at 50 percent in the new Rasmussen poll, which is the highest point he's been. Right. The new addition, I mean, he literally has more Republicans than anybody's ever had, and the Democrats are obviously on the other side. But but some of the, the mid-level mid uh, swing voters, uh, and Hispanic voters in particular, are now coming over to the Trump, the Trump side. Uh, equally as important, uh, we're finding in the, in the Scott race, in the gubernatorial race, he's, he's the governor of Florida, he's doing very well among Hispanics. So I think these numbers, getting Hispanic uh, workers back to work, uh, is helping immeasurably among Hispanic voters taking a second yeah. look. Here is, here is the President of the United States, who is constantly, daily, under siege by the unscrupulous Robert Mueller and his team of partisans, which uh, is engaged in nothing but a total uh, hoax and a witch hunt. Uh, and now, you know, you see Mueller's numbers going way right. down. You know, the longer his investigation goes, the less Americans have confidence in his objectivity and fairness. And he's uh, constantly under siege by the left wing media that rails on him day and night, night and day. Is it is it? A president under siege that is actually um, raising his numbers among Republicans? Well, he is, he's, he's holding, a, I mean, he's got an 83, 84 percent of Republicans uh, totally support him, which is, which is very, very high record number. Uh, they're not moving away from him. Uh, the critical thing is they get energized enough to go out and vote for him. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, normally when there's a crisis in a White House, uh, even when it's a White House chief of staff or staff person, places in chaos. This place has been under siege since the beginning. It's all aimed at the president, and he keeps moving forward. And he, he keeps, keeps saying it's unfair, isn't and it? apparently Republicans agree. I think Republicans do think it's unfair, because it is unfair. The critical thing, are they going to be energized? Are they going to turn out to vote? Uh, and that's the key, because Democrats, obviously, there's a lot of women candidates that are running, a lot of Democrats that are out there spending a fortune on this race. They've got to make sure that our side is every bit as energized. If they do, then it comes down to the independent votes and we will win that if if uh, if, if we get energized. All right. Normally, I would ask you how to handicap it, but not this far out. Too much it's, could it's happen. Too, too much can happen. Too much totally, can happen. Totally. Right Ed now, Rollins. right now, it's a 50 50 race. Yeah. Ed, Ed Rollins, thanks so much. My pleasure. Have a great, great weekend. You too. Take care. All right. Coming up next.
Obstructionist dims try their best to downplay the booming Trump economy, notwithstanding the fact that all American workers are winning. Niger Ennis and Sidney Powell will be joining us coming up next. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Greg Jarrett filling in for Lou Dobbs. Lou's off tonight. He'll be back Monday, though. You can count on it. We move now to the booming Trump economy, which shows no signs of slowing down. Point of fact, last month, 157,000 jobs added to the economy. Unemployment dropped to 3.9 percent, incredibly low. Hispanic unemployment fell to a record low, 4.5 percent. Second quarter GDP rose to 4.1 percent. That's its strongest since 2014. Despite those record-setting figures, Dems like Tom Perez and Nancy Pelosi continue to criticize the president's economic accomplishments. DNC Chair Tom Perez issued this statement. Hang on to your hats for this one. Donald Trump's reckless policies continue to hurt millions of hardworking families. Despite the promises Donald Trump made to the American people, Trump's economy isn't helping most Americans. Okay, that's an idiotic statement. Not to be outdone, though, Nancy Pelosi offered a similar rebuke, saying, quote, July's jobs report shows that the wealthiest 1% and big corporations continue to hoard the benefits of the GOP tax scam for the rich, while American workers are denied the bigger paychecks they deserve. Here's a note to uh, Nancy Pelosi. You're incredibly wealthy. Why don't you donate half your wealth to the federal treasury if you feel so passionately about it? Uh, the wealthy getting wealthier. Joining me now, Niger Innes, national spokesperson for the Congress on Racial Equality. Sidney Powell joins us, former federal prosecutor and author of License to Lie. Y you know, <laughs> the economy could be unemployment zero, GDP 20, and Perez and Pelosi would still say, oh, it's terrible and Trump's to blame. Niger, don't you think? Uh, unfortunately, I think that seems to be the case. And, and, and here's the irony of it all. It's not going to work for Democrats. I mean, rank and file folk know that we are in a booming economy. You know, people take for granted the uh, unemployment rate dropping below 4%. It's happened eight times, only eight times since 1970. Do you know what three of those eight times were? Just this year. And, you know, the American people know it. They know that uh, wages are, are, are coming up. Uh, the fact is that wages are higher now or, or, or the worker pay rate is the highest it's been since the Great Recession. You know, rank and file folk. I was just in the car with a, 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 one of your, your drivers and he was telling me how the economy is yeah. just is just booming. There's an excitement. There's an optimism among small businesses. That's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, that warm but over socialism talk might have worked when the American people were desperate in 2008. I don't think that dog's going to hunt in this right. election cycle. Sydney, um, the economy aside, what worries about bombshells from the unprincipled to, uh, Robert Mueller and his team of, of partisans? And, uh, you know, between now and the midterm elections, is he going to pull a Comey? Well, that's certainly a possibility. I, I think there might be more leaks than there would be any issuance of a report. As far as I know, he's still investigating and stirring up all he can possibly stir up, issuing subpoenas and still interviewing people. I don't think he shows any signs of wrapping this up as long as Trump's in but office, the, frankly. The witch hunt or the, or the Russia hoax is not going to probably end before uh, November? I doubt it. I can't imagine that it will. I mean, I think he's going to give your book a long life and congratulations on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. In fact, I quote your book, uh, License to Lie, about the lies that continue to come out of the Department of Justice. Uh, do you oh, think... and, the, and Andrew Weissman, no doubt. Yeah, and Andrew Weissman. Do you notice, uh, Sydney, by the way, that Andrew w Weissman is not getting anywhere near the courthouse in the Manafort trial, I think he fears that he's going to be called as a witness because he was leaking Manafort information to the media. He is, but yet I think he's largely responsible for that indictment and, and the overall prosecution of Manafort. He's the director behind it. Of course, that's what he did a lot in the Enron cases also. He, he stayed behind the scenes, but he was right. actually running the railroad, and a railroad it was.
Yeah. Um, Niger, I want your final thoughts here on uh, the impact that the the Russia hoax and the witch hunt has had not only on Trump's fortunes, but how it may impact the upcoming midterm elections. To be honest with you, I don't think it's going to impact it at all. I think the American people, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, are fundamentally fair. And they realize that whatever alleged crimes that uh, Manafort might have committed or not, that this occurred uh, when he, you know, some 10 years or so before he was even working for Trump for president. I don't I I just don't think that's going to sell. Sydney, you know, and I mentioned the Justice that- Department. Greg had already d- denied pressing charges against him. They had already yeah, for lack of evidence under Obama. The tax division at the it. DOJ. So we're not going to prosecute this guy for lack of evidence. One of the reasons was they couldn't prove a willingness. Um, it, isn't it true, Sydney? And, you know, you're the esteemed lawyer here that in most tax cases, you know, you pay a penalty and a fine and back taxes and so forth. And even if you are criminally convicted, you do about a year. Exactly. And most tax charges are treated as civil matters, as they should be. I think there are a lot of things we have grossly over-criminalized in this country. And as complex as the tax code is, particularly involving international structures, it should be treated as a civil matter. It's important for juries to know also that a single juror can stop an unjust criminal conviction for any reason just by voting not yeah. guilty and refusing well, to change their verdict. You know, this is this is Robert Mueller in action uh, going after Michael Flynn for lying, even though the FBI agents who interviewed Flynn said he was telling the truth. But Mueller, he knows better than everybody else. Um, thank oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> Niger Innes <laughs> and Sidney Powell, good to see you both. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. You too, Greg. Thanks so much. Cleanup has started out west after a massive wall of dust rolled over Phoenix. Forecasters say severe storms yesterday pushed the cloud over the city, destroying power lines, trees and homes. The near zero lack of visibility causing drivers to pull over as well as shut down the city's airport. And be sure to vote in tonight's poll. Do you think the national left wing media is growing increasingly hysterical because they sense the Trump wave coming in the midterms? Cast your vote. On Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Speaking of the media, the president lashing out at his attackers in the press at last night's rally that sent their Trump derangement syndrome, TDS, into overdrive. We're going to show you next. President Trump unleashing on the national left wing media last night at his rally in Pennsylvania. There is no way. According to fake news CNN, despite only negative publicity, only negative stories from the fakers back there. And even these people back here, these horrible, horrendous people, they can make anything bad because they are the fake, fake, disgusting news. Those comments sending the media predictably into a meltdown in which they compared Trump voters to a mob and questioned the president's mental health. Folks, right now it feels as if the president is operating in a parallel universe. The president of the United States is completely unhinged and getting worse by the day. The president doesn't like a watchdog. The president likes lap dogs. Dictators do not want a free press because it is a direct threat to their ability to lead. Do you have a, a security issue with the way that the mob is being turned on to journalists? Oh, we get it. You don't like us. Fine. But do you have to put our lives in danger? Yeah. You know, uh, in the war of words between the president and the press, the president seems to be winning. Gallup's latest approval poll shows 87 percent of Republicans support the president. Joining me now to talk about it, former Trump campaign surrogate Gina Loudon and Lawrence Jones, the editor in chief of Campus Reform. Good to see you. Um, Gina, let me start with you. One of the voices you heard was Mika Brzezinski accusing the president of becoming unhinged. I honestly don't know how Mika and Joe managed to think with those brains of theirs. But what's your reaction? 
Well, this clearly says more about their mental health than it does the president's. And actually, I just completed a book on exactly this topic called Mad Politics because our political uh, arena has become so crazy, so obsessed with this president that they make outlandish accusations that the rest of America, the heartland of America, Greg, can see are completely errant. You look at this president and the constant barrage of, of negative, evil attacks that he endures every single day, not to mention the obstructionist some in his own party that he has had to deal with. Then you compare that side by side to the, his list of accomplishments, and you know that this president is arguably one of the most sane occupiers of the White House ever in the history of the United States. Lawrence, what do you think? Well, Greg, the, the media, I don't think they should be worrying about the president's words. I, I think they should be looking at their own ratings or looking at their own approval ratings when it comes to the American people. I mean, the last poll showed that they were lower than Congress. And I mean, everyone hates Congress. So how do you uh, how are your ratings lower than Congress? Uh, but the media played a dangerous game. If you guys remember back during the primary, they gave this president as a candidate so much access. They loved him because they thought he was a beatable candidate. And then after the uh, the the primary during the general election, they flipped on him as a means uh, to support Hillary Clinton. So there's been this adversarial relationship ever since the general election. Uh, but the media really shouldn't be picking sides. It's not about if they like the president right. or, or, or dislike the president. They should just be reporting on the fact. And according to the American well, people, they don't feel like the media is doing that. The media's approval ratings are actually lower than phytoplankton, um, which is quite <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> Uh, yeah. you, know, I, you know, Gina, I keep hearing the media, the left wing media say, you know, this is the worst acrimony uh, in the history of the republic uh, with regard to a president. The media is so ignorant of history that they don't realize that, uh, for example, in the second term of uh, George Washington, there were angry mobs that surrounded the presidential mansion in Philadelphia, where uh, George Washington was inside, and the ugly, venomous uh, rhetoric in journals and publications back there condemning, uh, you know, the, one of the founders of our republic, George Washington, right. was unparalleled in 200 some odd years. Well, and they must have forgotten about the Civil War, uh, a little acrimonious oh, yeah. as well, where where the left, don't forget, took on the right who was, uh, you know, defending people for freedom to, from slavery. And right. so they must have uh, conveniently forgotten about that acrimony as well. But no, it, it, it shows, Greg, you know, they're very frustrated. And I understand they have no issues. They have no candidates. But worse, when you look at our, our job growth, our unemployment, unemployment of minorities that they have tried to parse up for years and and uh, control their votes. And now those populations are moving over to the president because they're seeing that the president is actually representing them. And I think you add to that numbers like came out today, for example, where unemployment, get this, I love this part, unemployment among people who've never graduated from high school, high school dropouts, right? is at a record historic all-time low. How does the left go ahead and continue to spout this mantra of being the champion of the little guy when it's right. this president that has employed you know, them and changed their lives? Um, the ignorance of the media, Lawrence, is only um, exceeded by, you know, their venom uh, towards this president. Um, you know, they have accused him constantly yes. of collusion um, they've never been able to cite a criminal code and all other potentials like uh, conspiracy to commit fraud, honest services fraud, federal campaign election acts have absolutely no application whatsoever and yet they continue the narrative. Well, it's not just collusion, Greg, but they call them racist every chance that they get. I mean, how is he supposed to respond to a press that calls him racist every day, it's collusion, he hates everyone, and, and, and they never provide positive coverage. Not, not even when they have data to support it, uh, not when the, the president is growing support. Like, 
there's nothing that he can do to please them. And so, I mean, they attack his family. You got the press secretary who rightly pointed out that she's the first sec pre uh, first press secretary to receive Secret Service right. protection. These are the same people that cried on election light night when their candidate didn't right. win. I mean, I, okay. I mean, if you don't believe us, at least believe the I people believe that you. view you guys. You know, Lawrence, <laughs> Lawrence Jones, Gina Loudon. Great to see you guys. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Great Thank to you. be with you. Thanks, you great. too. Coming up next, deadly wildfires out west continue to burn neighborhoods to a crisp. We'll have the latest on those infernos spreading across the state. Frightening information on this fire. Today's weather did not help crews fighting deadly and destructive wildfires in Northern California. Forecasters say humidity levels very low, making the land dry, ready to burn. The car fire near the city of Redding has killed six people, destroyed more than a thousand homes. And the National Weather Service reports a fire tornado that spun up last week had winds of more than 140 miles per hour. An engineering firm says a dam in Lynchburg, Virginia, is stable for now. Take a look at the pictures. Officials say up to six inches of rain fell within hours yesterday, filling the lake behind the dam beyond capacity. There were fears that the dam could fail and flood parts of Lynchburg with 17 feet of water in just seven minutes. And just a reminder tonight about my book, The Russia Hoax, The Illicit Scheme to Clear Hillary Clinton and Frame Donald Trump. Uh, is set to be number one on the New York Times bestseller list uh, beginning the weekend of August 12th. The numbers, though, are already in for its debut week. You can find it right now in bookstores or online, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, other places. That's it for tonight. Lou will be back on Monday, and we'll speak with Governor Mike Huckabee as well as Michelle Malkin. Thanks for joining us. Good night from New York. Have a great weekend. I'm Greg Jarrett in for Lou Dobbs.